Wow. Good evening and aloha. Aloha. Man, I am just moved by all of you being here in this most beautiful, beautiful building. You got the Lee Societies, you got Governor Ige, you got federal government, state, and you got the great workers of the city and county of Honolulu. But we stand here today, leap year day, special day. But we also sit here in this beautiful auditorium, which 100 years ago this year was just opened up, 1916. And at that time, Mayor Lane, the second mayor of the city and county of Honolulu, who was native Hawaiian, stood before an audience much like you. And just like then, many of you are probably thinking, God, I hope the mayor doesn't talk too long. <laughs> and I love to talk, but I only have 25 minutes. And I want to let you folks know that what happened in the last 100 years has been unbelievable, the changes that we've witnessed on this very small island of Oahu. And for me, it's about what do we do for the next 100 years? How do we lay that foundation? How do we set up that infrastructure that we can continue to live well, honoring those who walked in the foots in our, who walked here long before we showed up on these shores? How do we do that? And for me, it is about infrastructure. It's about laying that strong foundation and linking us all together so we can live better. And in fact, for me, the state of this city is basically about laying that foundation and that infrastructure that's been neglected for decades and decades and decades. And therefore, we set the goal. When I spoke here four years ago, the focus on five priorities, all related to infrastructure. Now, I believe it's important we report on that strat our status and where we are on this every single year. And I have now for four years. This is the fourth one because it's so important. And because it's been neglected for so long, it's not like we do it one year and then we move on to something else. It requires sustained effort to continue to move forward. And we said we report not, the good, not just the good news, but we don't hit targets also. And some may say, wow, that's kind of a novel idea, talking about when you hit them and when you don't. But for me, it's about building trust with the people of this land and making sure they know when we succeed and when we don't. You know, some, I don't like it when people campaign and say, I'm campaigning on these group of ideas. You get elected and you say, this is what we're gonna do. And as you go forward, as you hit difficulty, you change course and do something else. We are not changing our course. We're gonna continue to push forward on these five priorities for the four years because they deserve it and we need it. And we're gonna keep going forward. The first one are roads. You know, we set the goal of repaving 1,500 lane miles of substandard roads in five years. And we said we could do about 300 lane miles a year. So it'd take five years to do so. But here's the good news. We've repaved 1,000 miles already in just three years. And it's through the hard work of the city and county of Honolulu folks. <laughs> and we are now attacking some of the major thoroughfares around this island. We started on Baratania, finally, pushing Robert, and we're doing it. And we're doing Ward shortly, and we're going to be doing Date Street that, that has been neglected for decades. And we're not forgetting about the west side. We're going to be out there in the next couple months, and we're going to be paving 113 lane miles from Makaha, Waianae, and Nanakuli coming into town. We put $100 million in our fiscal year 17 budget to make sure we stay on target and pave every road that needs to be paved and we do a better job of maintaining those that we have paid, paved. On rail, I promise to real, build rail better. And I'm frustrated by the increasing cost of construction. And I'm upset by the increasing cost of construction. And for me, my reputation is on the line on this project. And I value my reputation. I was born here. I'm going to die here. I'm going to see all of you for the rest of my life and have to explain what happened with increasing costs. And so I take it seriously. But I want to thank the legislature last year 
for allowing us the authority to extend the surcharge for five more years. I want to thank Governor Ige, who's here tonight, for signing it into law. I tell you, the governor, I, he wouldn't tell me whether he's going to sign it or not, and then he signed it. This is how the governor is. He goes forward and does what is important. And then the city council stepped up and extended the surcharge for another five years. I want to give all of them a big round of applause. And I'm constantly pushing hard. I meet with them every week and sometimes multiple times a week to take a more aggressive approach to fiscal oversight and construction management. And that's why tonight, before all of you, I'm letting you know that I'm supporting a charter amendment. They're going to be voting on what charter provisions should go forward. A charter amendment that returns heart to the city and county of Honolulu once the system becomes operational because I believe it really deserves the attention of the people of the city and county of Honolulu, which if it's returned, will happen. <laughs> and if you ask Dan Grabowskis, I tell him every time I see him, go faster, no additional delays. We wanna finish this thing as quickly as we possibly can because every single month costs continue to go up. And we can't keep doing business in the same way and expect a different result. So I want a more aggressive oversight and greater transparency from Hart. Now, there's also a lot of good news to talk about too with Hart. We have our challenges, the largest construction project in the history of this place going right through the dense urban core. But here's the good news. This coming March, tomorrow, later in the month, our first train cars are gonna arrive on the shores of this island the first driverless train system in the history of the United States. We lead the nation in this way. Ninety percent of the maintenance facility has now been completed. That's where the cars are going to be parked every night, out by Pearl Harbor. And that's where the brain, the computer system, is going to be to actually run these cars so we only need 300 people to work at heart instead of the 1,800 we have at the bus company because you don't need people to drive the train. We've completed seven miles of the elevated guideway now, seven. We only have three miles to go before we complete the first 10 miles. We're getting close to almost halfway there. And last week, we broke ground out in Waipahu for the three transit stations out in that area. Look, I get it. Traffic is horrendous along the construction route. And business and lives are being affected every single day. And I know that's why people like William Campolo and his family are here tonight struggle with the traffic. William, could you please stand up with your family and be recognized? <laughs> they even brought their little daughter who looks kind of tired, probably because she has to get up early. But William is a Waianae resident, and he needs to wake up at 4 o'clock every morning to get to work in Waikiki stuck in traffic in his car. You know, this is not acceptable. And that's why rail is so important. We do not have another planned highway for the island of Oahu, even on the books. So if tomorrow we could say, let's build another highway, in 25 years after doing the EIS and all the rest, you'd see the result. Rail is the only, only alternative to transportation gridlock that we're building. It gives people a chance like William to get out of his car and to travel quickly and more efficiently no matter what's happening on the ground so he can get to work. It is critical that we continue to move forward on rail, that we sprint forward to the future instead of just running in place. <laughs> on bus, we promised to restore routes that had been cut. And in the past three years, we restored 11. And that's great because 225,000 rides are taken on our bus system, one of the most productive, one of the most service-oriented, one of the best systems in the country, top five. And that's why when Councilmember Kim Pine, who's here with us tonight, notified us that the people on the west side need more seats early in the morning to get into town to work, we listened. And so starting March 7th, Route 93 will offer a new 345 in the morning Service, think about it, we're all sleeping. People are getting on the bus at 3.45 to go to work. It's gonna start in Makaha and end up in town so that people can get to work. So many families on the west side 
are just struggling to stay in place with multiple jobs every day. And they need a chance to get to work more quickly. And that's why Zenaida Velasco, Richard Medeiros, and DeMont Connor are here because they're going to be writing that new route starting at 345. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. These are real people who struggle to live well on this island, and we feel for them. The hardworking people of the west side that sit in traffic all the time. We're not going to stop. We're going to continue to fight for rail because of people like this. On sewers, not sexy. For the most part, it's underground. You don't even see it when it's going on. But I love sewers. <laughs> We're working really hard with the federal government to make sure we meet all of our deadlines to rebuild our sewer system. And we're doing some incredible things that you probably don't even know. We put a new force main. This is pumping sewage under pressure. We used a robot micro, micro tunneler to dig a tunnel underneath the mouth of Honolulu Harbor. It's done and connected to Sand Island. I think that's really, really cool. <laughs> and on the windward side, we're building a massive sewer system, gravity flow three miles long, 400 feet below Oneave Hills, 13 feet in diameter, that's going to move sewage from Kaneohe sewage treatment to Kailua sewage treatment by gravity flow. We are so excited about this first ever in the state of Hawaii project. <laughs> and finally, as you know, when you come into town on Nimitz or you work in any of the high rises around town and you look out at Sand Island, you see this round egg, it looks like a giant emoji. We call it a digester. We love our one digester so much for building a second. And it's gonna be done by this summer. And it is so important because it takes, after we treat our sewage, it becomes sludge and from the sludge we turn it into fertilizer. And without a second digester, all the building you see going on in the urban core, middle class workforce housing like Marshall Hung's 801 South or Stanford Carr's Halikuila Place could not go forward. We need this digester to address capacity issues so we can build housing for our families. Finally, in our fiscal year 17 budget, which in CIP is going to be $834 million, that's a lot, really a lot. And of that amount, $490 million, almost half a billion, is for sewers alone. That's up from $213 million last year because we're putting our priorities on rebuilding our sewer system. On parks, the place where we gather, our front yards, where we can relax and sit out and feel the breezes like today. Today was an incredible day to be in any of our parks. And last year we set Kako for the parks, together for our parks. How do we help make them even better? And I made a commitment last year at our State of the City address in the beautiful Foster Botanical Gardens that we'd restore 24 restrooms and fix 12 playground stations. And guess what happened in the intervening year? Parks and Rec went to work. They restored 27 restrooms, three more than we committed to. They, re they rebuilt 16 playgrounds, four more than we committed to. And then they went for extra credit and did another 10 new playgrounds. This is fantastic. Our Parks and Rec guys are hardworking. They wear blue shirts. They're sweating every day. Seven days a week, they're in our parks. And to help them, we're hiring 20 new groundskeepers and maintenance people because we know we need to do a better job maintaining our parks. We also, in our call for the parks, ask the community to step up. And so tonight, I want to recognize Cedric and Benjamin Gates from Active Hawaii Foundation. Would you please stand up and be recognized? This young kid reached out to Councilwoman Kimberly Pine and said, we want to show greater love for Makaha Valley Community Park. They stepped up, we stepped up, we went Kako together, and that park got refurbished. But more importantly, the community loves it so much that nothing bad happens to it, right? Right, Cedric? It's in good shape if we go out there. Yes. So in the 
fiscal year 17 budget, we put $1.4 million so we can continue to restore restrooms and playgrounds. And we put $21.6 million in capital improvements for parks all around this island, our front yards. And we're focusing on two legacy parks, our historic parks. One is Thomas Square, our oldest park in the state of Hawaii. In fact, it's one of the oldest parks in the United States of America. In fact, it's so old that when it became a park, Hawaii wasn't even part of the United States of America. We're committing $1.9 million more million to make sure this park continues to live for another 100 years. <laughs> and at Ala Moana Beach Park, our people's park, where we all gather, everyone from this island, even neighbor islands goes there, we're putting $3 million more to make sure that park continues to be improved. Finally, on homelessness, it's not an infrastructure project, but it's a serious, serious problem and challenge. And it's not just a state problem, it's not just a city problem, it's all of our problem. And Governor Ige recognized that. He called us together through a leadership group on homelessness. No silos, and I believe we are making a difference by working together. Thank you, Governor Ige. We continue to do enforcement. Thomas Square today is much different than Thomas Square three years ago. Inha Park, no tents. You can enjoy the park and be on the sidewalk. And in Waikiki, you can walk down Kalakaua and not trip over people sitting or lying. It, sidewalk is being used for what it's supposed to be used for. But we have compassion here too. We have good news. Partnering up with the Institute of Human Services, we opened the first ever navigation center at Sand Island. And people like Uncle Clay and Uncle Kala, who are current residents of the Sand Island Center, are here with us tonight. Please stand up and be recognized, these two fine men. I heard them speak to the press and to the staff out of Sand Island. They talked about getting their dignity back. They talked about having hope once again. They talked about being able to close their doors at night and know they were safe. And knowing that when they left during the day and locked the door, they knew their stuff would be there when they came back. They get three square meals a day. They get to use the lua and take a shower in privacy. These are the kind of people we are helping. We need to do much more to help people like Uncle Clay and Uncle Kala. And we teamed up with IHS to house 173 chronic homeless folks last year in Housing First. 173, and this year we're putting another $6.6 .6 million into the FY17 budget to do even more. That means we're gonna house approximately another 173 chronic homeless folks along with the ones we're already housing, we gotta keep housing them, for a total of 346 folks. We are making a difference, but this is a long journey that we're just beginning. Last year, under pressure from Michelle Obama and the Obama administration, I took a pledge to end veterans' homelessness in the city and county of Honolulu. And working closely with the state and our federal providers and our third-party private providers, we housed almost 600 chronic homeless veterans. We didn't hit zero. We know there are 55 more out there. But if we would not have made this pledge and would not have worked with the state and federal government, we would have gotten nowhere near to where we are today. And the governor and I had a landlord summit. We reached out to the landlord saying, can you provide more units to house these veterans? And Kathy Chalk, a Honolulu landlord, stepped up and said, I'll provide you not just one, I'll give you eight. And tonight she is here with Uncle Joe, an Air Force veteran who's been in and out of homelessness for eight years. He is one of Kathy's tenants. We want to ask both of them to stand up and be recognized. Where's Kathy and Uncle Joe? We love both of you, and you set a great example for the rest of us. You know, in closing, we've hit targets. We met goals, and it's been done because of the team effort, no silos, everyone working really, really hard. And when I say everyone, I mean the 9,000 
people who work here at the city and county of Honolulu. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, dealing with our sewage, our water, our garbage pickup, our parks, everything else in between. And I want to recognize them and give them a big round of applause. A good example of that was Eddie Aikau Surf Meet last week. Within 24 hours notice, they said, we're going to do the eddy. We have one false start. The bay calls the day. The bay called the day. In 24 hours, the Honolulu Police Department, the Honolulu Fire Department, our water safety folks, our parks and recs folks working with the State Department of Transportation made an event that was epic. Epic. And I think everyone here felt this closeness and pride of what happened on that day, a sport that is definitely Hawaii's and Hawaiian. And yet, no matter whether you're Hawaiian or not, we were connected that day. And Clyde Akau is here tonight. I would like you to stand up and give him a big round of applause. Where's Clyde? You know, Clyde, you may have seen him take that wave, 30-foot face. He went down it. He had a fall. He tore his rotator cuff. He's, that's why he has a, this, this um, ace bandage on right now. But he told me that he was, when he was out there, his older brother, Eddie, was with him. And he told him to go, and he went. Thank you, Clyde. Finally, I want to close with this picture. Any of you who have been in my office have seen it. I know Kim Pine has. I know Ron Menor has. I know Brendan Elefante has. Susie, you may have seen it too. It's a picture of John F. Kennedy. It hung in every post office in the land, in many homes around our country and around the world. This picture was taken in 1960. But what's so special about this picture are the words signed by President Kennedy. And it says, to Senator Dan Inouye, with highest esteem and warmest regards from his friend, John Kennedy. Special picture. This was waiting on my counter when I came back from lunch shortly after I became mayor, about a month after the senator had died. It was given to me by his widow, Irene Inouye. When I saw it sitting there like this, I cried. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot going on in this picture. 1960. John F. Kennedy just became president. He was 42 years old, the youngest president in the history of our country. Dan Inouye just became a United States senator, 35 years old, the first Japanese American, first Asian to serve, well, second actually, Hiram Fong was there before him, first Japanese American to serve in the Senate. John Kennedy from Boston, Massachusetts. Dan Inouye from Honolulu, Hawaii. Massachusetts, one of the first states. Hawaii, the last state. John Kennedy, Irish Catholic. Dananoi, Japanese American. They had to struggle to get to these goals because of who they were. Both of them were war vets, served in World War II, and were injured seriously. The interesting thing is the one from Massachusetts served in the South Pacific, the one from Hawaii, because of the color of his skin, served in Italy. They both got elected at the same time, and they dreamed huge, huge dreams. John Kennedy gave a speech about landing a man on the moon in 10 years. I remember that speech in Hilo. It made me so proud as an American. It made me realize as just a kid, they can dream big dreams and work really hard and accomplish those dreams. John Kennedy didn't live, live to see that day, but we did it in less than 10 years. And it's what we need today. Dan Inouye, I worked for Dan Inouye. I met my wife working for Dan Inouye. He taught us all to be humble, but he also said, we in Hawaii are not less than, we're not even equal to, we are greater than because of the unique history of this place. <laughs> Both of these men dreamed big dreams. They laid a foundation and they inspired us. And I believe tonight when I talk about priorities, it's about laying that foundation and having those big dreams for those who are not yet here. 
I can't believe I'm in my fourth year. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. It has flown by so quickly. A couple months. I love every minute of my job. There isn't a day that I don't regret going to work. You can ask my wife, Donna Tanoy, who's sitting here next to the governor. I wake up every morning, usually almost seven days a week, and I sprint out of bed because I like coming to work for all the people of the city and county of Honolulu and tackling the problems that are there. I'm so lucky and I'm so grateful. It's the best public service job you can have. I'm sorry, Governor, I think mine's better. <laughs> and I believe together we are making a difference. And that's what I'd like to encourage all of you here tonight, just like I encourage our cabinet at the end of every cabinet meeting, go out, work hard, move the needle, be better. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. I want to let you know it's an honor to work for you. I also want to let you know I love each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Mahalo and aloha.